this is an area that has been going on. I've been involved in it since probably the early 90s, maybe mid 90s at the latest. And it has done nothing but uh, grow. And the reason why we're speaking to you today is that it used to be, again, as most things are, Fortune 50 companies, we worry about it, then the Fortune 100, then the Fortune 500, then the Fortune 1000. And what we're seeing, and I can see by the nods by my fellow panelists, we're seeing it filter down if you're a million dollar business, if you're a $50 million business, uh, this is going to impact you because the states need money. This is a way to get them. Um, it is an audit process. And at the end of the day, you end up paying them something. And it's, you know, and we'll talk about later on, we have slides that do reference taxes versus unclaimed property. And there are significant differences that we'll get into. This feels like it, but for all of those that have been involved in the bookkeeping or the reserve analysis, what we find is on the tax side, if nothing else, you're aware of positions that you take or don't take and you make determinations and you set up reserves so that you can address it later on. It's not a hit to earnings later on. And, and we'll talk about how in an M&A uh, scenario, this affects it and why we're looking at in due diligence. But this is one of those that I can honestly say over 90%, if not higher, of my clients that get hit with an unclaimed property audit, one, have never heard of it, two, didn't know that it existed, three, they all yell, they can't do that, and four, have zero dollars reserved for it. And that's really the impactful thing, is that this comes right off your bottom line when it ultimately comes to culmination, and we're seeing a lot more activity, and the dollars are shockingly huge. And, and it's, it, it, I, you know, and we'll get into this, and Sam will take us through kind of the introductory stuff, what, where this came from, but this is how simple it is. And I, I just, this is the simplest of explanations. What's unclaimed property? I thought about what, if I was teaching a fourth grade class, a second grade class, a high school class, how would I describe it? I describe it the same way. If, and this is really kind of shows my age. If I wrote somebody a check, okay? And that's, I know that's a myth that ha doesn't happen anymore. I still write a couple, but you would write a check, you would mail it or give it to somebody. Well, one of the things about checks is that they were paper, people lost them, they got destroyed. And sometimes, Sometimes those checks never got cashed. Now, when I was in high school and college and law school and married and had kids and still using checks anytime when I went to balance my checkbook, because I'm an accountant, I'm crazy about that. I balance things. I, someone didn't cash it after 60 days, 90 days. You're like, woohoo! you put it back into income. You put it back into your balance. Well, in the real world, if you do that, it's illegal. And what you actually have to do, and we'll get into the nitty gritty about here, you owe that money to somebody and the state raises their hand and says, pay me, we'll hold it for them. You don't get to add back things into income or into cash. You pay somebody else to hold them. And Sam's going to get into a little bit of the history of it. And it has ramifications beyond just checks, payroll, payable. And as we'll talk about when we get to audits, on the receivable side, it's inconceivable to me, it sounds like a Princess Bride reference, um, it's inconceivable how on an account receivable you can have unclaimed property because that's money that's owed to you. So how do you have a responsibility? But I would tell you, and I would look for the panelists to agree or disagree, but the largest numbers that the states get now is on the AR side. It's because of things called credits, whether it's an early payment credit, quantity discount credits, uh, damaged goods credits, those are AR account, um, accounts. And that's where the big dollars are because no one wants to pay those out because it's, you're just sitting on the money. So we'll get into all of that. Um, we encourage you, I have to go through some technical things beyond just getting excited about the topic. One is if you have technical issues hearing us, or if you think I'm talking too fast and it has nothing to do with your machine, it's the fact that I talk really fast, I get excited about this stuff. So it's not you, you can't slow me down, this is what I do. So <laughs> that's not a technical issue. That's Jordan Goodman and I will try to keep it at a calm level. But if you have technical issues, if you're trying to get CPE, if you the polling questions aren't working for you, we have a wonderful person who is not shown on the screen here who will take all of that. Her name is Hillary. Okay, pronounce your last name, Major Sam. Forte. What's your last name? Mag. Major Forte, that's my guess. Yeah, There's Mag a lot Forte. of consonants in there. Anyway, it's in all of your materials. Everything that gets sent to you has her contact information. That's who you reach out to. Secondarily, um, if you have questions during our presentation, you can use one of two functions. We encourage you to use one, questions and answers. It's on the bottom of your screen called Q&A. Send us, type us out a question and we can address that. There's also the chat function 
that you can use to specifically go to me or anybody else or to everybody or to just the panelists. Both of those functions will work. Q&A works a little bit better because we'll have specific information about what question you have and we'll get back to you. Our goal is to address these things throughout the presentation, but to the extent that we don't have time or it's a very specific question, we promise you we'll get back to you with answers later on. We encourage questions. This may be very new to a lot of you and we're here to let you know about it. All right, so um, Sam, let's go on to our agenda. Uh, here's how we broke things down and we'll be trading off our presentation uh, from the presenters. Unclaimed Property 101, we use back to basics. Um, really, it's just the basics. We're not saying that you know about it, don't know about it, but we wanna make sure that this concept makes sense. And it's basically something that you're gonna to owe to somebody else, usually a state or all the states and the battles are going on. So we wanna get you to that common understanding of the property we're talking about and who gets owed and what you have to look for. And, and we're, then we're gonna reach down into Delaware. And the reason why we mentioned Delaware is because as we'll talk about priority rules, who do you owe the money to? Delaware becomes a very important part. Delaware is a state where most businesses are incorporated. And by the way, the US Supreme Court has, has relegated where you have to pay the states. If a debt is unknown, a last known address is not known, and we'll talk about that when we talk about estimation, it goes to Delaware. So Delaware has been on in the front float in the parade on unclaimed property. They're up front trumpeting it, hiring third parties, being a true pain in the butt. And what they're doing now is every couple of months, they're issuing audit notices to more and more people. There's a lot of things that you can do with that. There's ways to minimize that. And Scott and Laura are going to get into that a little bit. Then we're going to come into, because I know a lot of you guys have been involved, guys and gals have been involved in M&A deals. It's really prevalent now due to the pandemic. Businesses failing, businesses succeeding, lots of going on. We have worked with our internal people on due diligence and talked about VDAs and, and unclaimed property, normally talk about state and local tax. We've added... Uh, do uh, unclaimed property to that because the dollars can be huge and we've, we've gotten a couple of buyers that have been really burned by not doing their proper work in the M&A process. We'll talk about how it comes up and not. And then some things for you guys to think about, kind of summarizing everything we've done, culminating with a, here's what's going to happen, be prepared. And if you have questions, let us know. Okay, that's really how we want to progress. But again, we look to you guys to ask us questions, to slow us down. It's so important for us, for you guys to understand this. This is unlike any other tax topic, any accounting topic, anything in books and records or controllers or accountants or CFOs. This is something you generally don't deal with. And that our job today is to educate you a little bit to recognize where the issues are and how to address them. Before we get going, Jordan, I have one more big thing we need to do. Introduce everyone. So, okay. so Jordan, Jordan and I work at Horde Marks and Burke, uh, and we have with us today Scott Regan and Laura Carlson from Altus Group. And uh, the combination between all of us, I think, is a really interesting one. We're, you know, we're more on the consulting, the legal side. They're more on the compliance side. So we make a, a really good duo here. Um, and one more area that I want to discuss, too, is the polling questions. So to the extent that you guys have uh, issues seeing the polling questions, if they don't pop up at any point in the presentation, don't fret, uh, we'll work it out. Hillary will make sure that you still get CPE credit. So please don't worry. Um, that is, is something that usually happens if you're going either through maybe uh, the browser on your phone or maybe you haven't downloaded Zoom. So don't worry. So uh, before we delve in, anything else you guys want to discuss before I hit into the basics of unclaimed property? Well, I, I do want to just one question I gotten. Yes, I am in my RV. Yes, it's in LA, lower Alabama. Well, let's move on. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Jordan, it will be in Alabama, but hopefully you won't be uh, having any technical issues. So all good. Um, the basics of unclaimed property. I'm gonna give you guys the who, the what, the when, the where, why of unclaimed property before we really delve into remediation efforts and voluntary disclosures, which are what Scott and Laura are going to help explain. Uh, Jordan, I think gave us a really good intro as to, to what is unclaimed property. It's, it's tangible property, it could be intangible property that's been abandoned by its owners. And abandon is a question that I think you might be wondering, what does that mean? What does it mean when something's abandoned? Well, there's no activity and there's no contact by the owner of the property for a certain period of time. And that period of time depends on a state statute. 
it depends on the type of property at issue. And those periods of time are based on when there was the last point of contact by the owner. And those are gonna be referred to throughout this presentation as dormancy periods. So again, each state has a different dormancy period for a certain piece of property. And that sort of makes this whole thing put into context, right? Why is unclaimed property so tricky? Well, there's 50 states in DC and each state has their own set of rules. They have their own set of requirements for a sheet and uh, it can become pretty difficult for holders to try to comply. Now I just use the word holder. What is a holder? Yeah. Uh, Jordan, I can see Jordan's face. Explain that to us. Uh, so a holder is the person, they have the property. They have the property that's not technically theirs and they need to get it off their balance sheet. They can't just convert it to income as Jordan said. If, if you uh, issued that check to one of your employees and they didn't cash it, you can't just convert it to income. You have to report it to the state. And the state can only exceed, this is important, debts that are actually owed by a debtor to a creditor. If there's no debt owed, well, a state can't create one, right? They can't require a purported holder to exceed it. Um, and that becomes sort of a, an, I think a really interesting issue within the context of audit. Um, but these, these overarching principles, they, there are some, right? There are overarching principles that are set forth um, by the states, but again, each state has its own set of rules that we have to sort of comply with throughout this process. You may be wondering why, why do we care about unclaimed property? Why is this such a, a big issue? Well, aside from revenue for the states, which has become a really important part of this, the purpose of unclaimed property though is really supposed to be to reunite lost owners with property that's rightfully theirs. I think it's, uh, we were talking about this earlier, it's sort of delved into something, I think more than that, it's become a real revenue grab for the states. But really the purpose behind this is to reunite those owners with their property, um, to make sure that they have the rights that are really theirs. Hey Sam, I just, I'm gonna put this in context. So in, okay. in my analogy about a check, as a check, I write a check to Sam. Sam is the owner of that check and the money associated with it. If she doesn't cash the check, for a year, it becomes unclaimed property. I'm the holder of that funds, right? Because it has not gone out of my bank account. So it is still residing in my bank account. So I'm the holder and I have an obligation to either find Sam and give her the money, or then if it's if it's the dormancy period, give it to the state to hold for Sam forever. And, and I call that the win, right? The dormancy period, that's the when do I give it to the state? And then which state do I give it to? Those we're gonna go through in the next couple slides. Um, as Jordan pointed to in the introduction, there is a, a big difference between unclaimed property and a tax, right? So even though we're, we're SALT practitioners and this sort of falls into our lap, they, a tax and unclaimed property is, is different whether it be the way that the audits function, right? The way that we interact with these third party audit firms, or it could be just uh, the statute of limitations. So you can see here, there are a few really important ways that they're distinct that I, I wanna sort of go through. I think one is, is net operating losses and apportionment. You know, I hear all the time from clients, well, you know, we have, we have NOLs in the state, so we shouldn't have a liability or our apportionment factor in the state is small. So we shouldn't have much unclaimed property. That's not relevant. None of that's relevant. That, those are all income tax concepts. What we have here is a financial obligation, right? It's an expense, it's an above the line expense. So regardless of whether you have a, a small apportionment factor or an NOL, it doesn't matter because whether a state has the right to a sheet is based on these priority rules, which we're gonna explore in the next couple slides. And that sort of gets into nexus too. There is no concept of nexus with unclaimed property. It's not like income tax uh, or sales tax where you have these either bright line economic nexus thresholds or uh, minimum you know, contacts within a state in order to a sheet. It's really not relevant here. Uh, we have these priority rules where those dictate which states get to a sheet property. Statute of limitations is another key difference. So unlike income tax, where statute of limitations is generally three to four years if you filed returns, for unclaimed property, the statute of limitations can be far more extensive. They can be 10 to 15, year, uh, 10 to 15 years. Some states have even sought to apply statute of limitations tolling provisions retroactively. Um, some of you may have seen the case AT&T where uh, the court said, no, you can't do that. 
Delaware recently, um, we're going to focus a lot on Delaware throughout this, and that's because of the priority rules. It makes Delaware a big player in unclaimed property. But Delaware recently reduced their look back period for audits and VDAs to 10 years plus the dormancy period. Um, so it's 10 years from the date the duty arose, whether or not the holder reported the property. And the statute of limitations began, it used to begin from the date uh, that the time the holder reported the property. So that was a big change in Delaware that's really shaped some of these audits. Um, I kind of want to put this into practice, right? So you're thinking statute of limitations, this can't be a big money maker for us, or this can't be a big liability for us. If you have unclaimed property, let's say it's about $50,000. An average look back period is let's say 15 years, you know, between the 10 years plus the dormancy period. Well, 15 times, <laughs> 50,000, you're already up to 750,000. You tack on penalties of 25%. You tack on interest of 10 to 15%. And you can see why what seemed like maybe a small liability can be either extrapolated or can turn into something much larger. And extrapolation is an issue that, that Scott and Laura are going to explore because it's become a, a big dollar issue. Uh, a, a huge difference between just the audit process for an unclaimed product unclaimed property audit versus a sales tax or an income tax audit is you're not working usually directly with the Department of Revenue. The states will engage third party contract firms. Kelmar is the biggest one and they use them to conduct the audits on their behalf. And what's, what's really concerning is they get paid on a contingency fee. They get paid based on what they bring in. So they've got skin in this game. And uh, as a result, we often see them a little bit more aggressive, less willing to sort of settle or to compromise within these audit processes. Uh, whether contingency fees can be used in an audit is sort of an open question. There was a, a case filed in December of 2019 with a few companies, AT&T, Eaton, Through the Loom and Siemens, you may have heard of that case, where they're challenging the use of contingency fee auditors and uh, there was actually a recent court filing in January of 2020 where Delaware tried to uh, add as an exhibit a contract that they signed with Kelmar where they show they're being paid on an hourly basis, not a contingency fee basis. So that's sort of an open question whether states will move more towards hourly as opposed to contingency fee. But in the meantime, what you have are really just really aggressive firms doing these audits on behalf of the states. Record retention is one more difference that I want to explore. So most states on claim property laws have record retention requirements that are longer than state tax statutes. So what that means is maybe you're only keeping records for a few years because you've, you've looked at the sales and use or you've looked at the income tax statutes, but you get audited for unclaimed property. And now they have record retention requirements of whether it's, it's 10 years in Delaware as of a few years ago, or uh, RUPA also says, RUPA is the Revised Uniform Unclaimed Property Act. We're gonna refer to that a lot throughout. Um, they just sort of have a general set of rules that some states have adopted, some states have, have bought into. They say 10 years, but it can be as much as 15 years. So you haven't kept records. And now the state is, is auditing those, those periods and they can potentially extrapolate the periods that they do have records for over those longer periods, creating exposure creating liability in periods that you really never would have thought were open to audit. You know, and if Sam, we can't emphasize enough this record retention requirement, statute of limitations. I mean, uh, it's, in Sam said Delaware again, the biggest state has said, oh, we'll reduce it to 10 years. You don't have to that, but it's 10 years plus five of their dormancy period. So you have to have 15 years worth of records. Now, I don't know about you guys, but 15 years ago, I think we just moved out of the floppy disk world, right? We don't even, who cares about that? And from a business retention, you talk to the law people, they say nothing gets, anything over seven years has to go through us if it's a litigation hold or something like that. They wanna destroy everything at the latest after seven years. And now you've got saying, well, no, we need 15 years of records or 20 years of record. And as Scott and Laura are gonna go through, the extent that you don't have it, it is a huge punishment. A huge punishment because they're gonna make stuff up and that's really what happens they make stuff up you don't have books and records we'll just figure something out and it that's where we get into our litigation that's where we get into our big dollars yeah in an ideal world you do a best practice of figuring out what the retention requirements are in each of the states and then you keep it based on the longest that would be a you know a good benchmark but 
in what ideal world is that really happening, right? That would be a good best practice. But what happens in reality is that you get shocked or surprised with these audit notices. And now they're trying to uh, extrapolate it back to a really lengthy period of time. And, and we've been involved in these, and I know Lauren has got it as well, where you go back to generally general counsel's office saying, well, we need you to retain the accounting records for at least 15 years. And they look at you like you're a Martian because they just don't do that. That's just not the, it's not the business practice they've grown up with. They don't understand it. And you say, well, it's about unclaimed property. And they go, what? And they go, you got to, got to hold it for what, for when? And, you know, they're familiar with litigation holds, but this is a completely different animal. Yep. Um, so I think even if, even at this point, if you're still thinking, well, this doesn't apply to what we have, you know, we've talked about checks. That's a, you know, a pretty obvious example of unclaimed property. Maybe this list will sort of put it into a framework for you that there are a bunch of different types of intangible property that, uh, constitute unclaimed property and, and can be required to be escheated to a state. Um, some of the ones I think that we've seen most often within the audit context that can really create liabilities are customer overpayments. So a customer overpays for an item, uh, you just convert it to income, you don't refund it or you refund it and they don't take it and it's just sitting there. That can be uh, construed as, as unclaimed property by a state. Um, annuities or refunds, same sort of concept with, uh, with refunds as overpayments. That is a, is a really huge example of where we've seen liability created within an audit. Uh, gift cards, many states have uh, put out guidance um, either indicating the gift cards are or are not unclaimed property. Um, digital currency, I think is a really interesting one. Uh, Delaware recently said that they, can, they consider that to be unclaimed property. I say good luck, <laughs> the whole point of digital currency is anonymity and you know, sort of hiding under the veil. So good luck to states trying to uh, reclaim that property. But, you can see here that this is, is, it's way more than a check, right? It's way more than, uh, you know, a, a refund or, a, a, you know, your basic sort of remittances that are made to uh, an owner or to a customer. It can really be expansive here. And that's why these sort of audits can, can go on for years and can really um, take a lot of time to work through. So we've done the what. Here's the where. So where is the money supposed to be reported to? Which state gets the money? So historically, it was really easy for tangible personal property because the rule was that the state goes to the property where it's located, right? But what about all of these intangibles we just talked about? There was a decision back in 1965. It was a, it was a really important Supreme Court decision called Texas v. New Jersey, where they settled this question. And they laid out two priority rules. So the first is that the property is escheated to the creditor's last known address per their books and records. Um, this makes sense because it's the property interest of the owner, right? So we should focus on their last known address. But often you don't have that sort of information, right? Um, so if you don't, if there is no record of the owner or the creditor's last known address, then it goes to the debtor's state of incorporation or the holder, what Jordan referred to earlier, the person that's holding the money, it goes to their state of incorporation. And that's why you can see how Delaware becomes a big player here. Because if you don't have records showing where the owner's last known address is, it goes to your or the holder's state of incorporation, which is you know, more substantially or not in Delaware than other states. How do, how do these states work together? Well, some states have reciprocity agreements um, if there is sort of a question as to multiple states having a right to a street property, but not all states have that um, sort of reciprocity agreement, which creates issues. Uh, there is a note here about nexus. I mean, as we already mentioned, it's, it's really not relevant in the context of unclaimed property. You know, put all of the, everything you know about uh, income tax and sales tax and sort of put it to the side here. And I, you know, I think, this is important now that you understand the priority rules, you understand why uh, Delaware is such a key player, is gonna frame why we have put so much focus within this presentation on Delaware's unclaimed property BDA program. So that leads to our first polling question. Uh, let me mm -hmm. poll. What is your company's state of incorporation? Number two in the priority rules. I'll give you just a, a couple 
more minutes to answer. Options include Delaware, New York, California. Nevada is losing with a, a big 0%. Um, and none of the above, which is uh, a competitor here. Guys, Delaware. I'm just going Delaware. Yeah, yeah. Take your guesses here, guys. What do you think it's going to be? I know the answer, so I can't participate. <laughs> Gotta be Delaware. So we've got most of uh, the participants in. And again, if you have if you have problems with the polling, don't worry. Email Hillary. You'll get your credit for CPE if that's if that's important to you. Uh, so let me share the results here. <clears throat> So it, it's kind of 50-50 between Delaware and none of the above. Yep. So what that means is maybe uh, maybe you are a practitioner. Maybe you're uh, not the company that's worried about incorporation, or you're just somewhere else. You could be in Illinois. You could be elsewhere. Let's just, just focus on that for a second. The reason why Delaware is so high up is that from a business perspective, the rules are easy. You get good poison pill defenses. You get good meeting defenses. The requirements are are low. The franchise tax that they charge you to be a Delaware corporation is, is nominal. One, and, and we get asked, what state should I incorporate in? Well, one of the reasons why Delaware is not good is because of unclaimed property. And we'll get through how that all works and you'll see why. But it, it's, it's one of the many factors that a business has to review prior to picking a state of incorporation. I mean, there's a lot of business reasons to be there, but there's some, it's not all bells and whistles. It's not all, was it, butterflies and smiles to be in Delaware. All right, so let's move on from the polling. Um, now let's move on to when. So when when do you have to a street property? When does it become dormant? That word we used before to talk about when the owner just hasn't contacted you in a while, right? They That property has been sitting and at what point do you have to then give it to the state? So as we talked about the dormancy periods, the time during which the property remains unclaimed, right? So that's the period on, before it becomes escheatable. And that's based on, again, the date of last contact. When did the owner reach out? And that, that period can be started by sending out a letter, um, reaching out to the owner to try to reset that clock. Um, but it's, it's generally the dormancy period, how long it is before you have to report that money to the state is de decided by two things, really. Decided by one, what state it is, uh, based on those priority rules that we just saw on the last slide, and what type of property is it? So using an example, so wages, for example, uh, Delaware, it's a five-year dormancy period versus Illinois is just a one-year dormancy period or dividends, it's three years for both Delaware and Illinois. Um, RUPA, which I, I mentioned earlier, is uh, sort of set some general guidelines that some states have adopted, has a, a dormancy period generally of about three years. I mean, I like to think about a, a general dormancy period of about three years. So once that dormancy period passes, the holder, the person with the money, is required to do perform a due diligence process. What does that mean? Well, you've got to try to reach out to the owner um, prior to cheating it. You can't just give it to the state. First, you have to engage in this process where you try to confirm the owner's uh, interest in the property by sending them notice which is, is generally done by a due diligence letter. And um, there is really important language that has to be in those letters. Each state has their own set of rules as to what needs to be in it. Because what's important is that there can't be any, um, you can't be wishy-washy as a holder that that's the right. You have to make it clear that it's the owner's property, they have a right to it. And uh, California is really strict. They have some really uh, strict required language that is, is worthy of looking at. Um, if you want an example letter, most states have an example letter as part of their, their holder um, information on their websites. Um, but uh, as far as when to do this process, so most states require that the letter, this due diligence letter that goes out, be sent no more than 120 days before reporting the property to the state. You can't just send out the letter, then sit on it for a while, then it's cheated. It has to be a really planned out timely process um, in order to make sure that you have really put in all efforts to contact the owner. Um, so as best practice, you know, I, I like to say 30 to 60 days um, before, uh, you know, wait 30 to 60 days for an owner's response um, before sort of pursuing the process of achieving it to the state and include a deadline in the letter, put it in there, make it clear that the owner has to respond by a certain date. 
So what if uh, the owner doesn't respond? That's, that's when you take the next step. That's when you file the reports with the state. Um, and I think, you know, what's also important in this process is how these due diligence letters are sent. So states have different requirements based on um, what information the holder has, what do they have in their books and records. So as an example, New York says that uh, due diligence mailings have to be sent um, regardless of the amount of property issued, if you have their, the, uh, the owner's last known US or international address versus Texas only requires due diligence mailings if the value of the property is greater than $250. So whether you have to engage in this due diligence process, whether you have to send out these letters to the owner's last known address is sort of based on um, the amount of property, it's based on how much information you have, and it's based on the state. Uh, how do you mail it? So most states require it be, it be sent by first class mail. Um, some states have even harder requirements, even more strict requirements. Uh, like I say, like New Jersey or New York or Ohio require certified mailing for amounts of over a thousand bucks. Um, and uh, there is also a concept of advertising or publishing requirements. So a couple of states like New York and Puerto Rico require you to advertise it, to put it in the newspaper, to, to make it clear uh, throughout um, the state that there is this ownership um, of this property. Delaware doesn't have an advertising requirement. They got rid of it in 2017. Um, but these are what we've talked about here is the step you take before you give the money to the state. The requirements you have to go through again to contact the owner throughout the due diligence process. And this has sort of all sort of been in the context of mailings. But keep in mind that certain states have email requirements as well. Um, some states either allow it or requirement. Um, Tennessee requires that you not only send a mailing, but you also contact the owner if you have an email address, which is probably the more common way um, that you might have uh, an owner's contact at this point, especially if there's some sort of purchase online. So that's, that's the when. Um, and this is, this is more about when to file the actual reports, right? So that was the process of when does the property become dormant? When does it become owed? And now this is when do I report it to the state? So in short, most states have a fall reporting deadline. Um, Delaware's is March 1st. So I, I'm just putting this sort of in, in context for you. Let's use Delaware as the example. So if you have a period ending December 31st, 2020, and that means that your report, your payment is gonna be due March 1st, 2021. But what, am I, what periods am I including in that report? What does that cover? So let's, let's assume it's a piece of property, like a check that has a three-year dormancy period. That means that the property that's gonna be included in that report is gonna be back from a date of last contact of 2017. Or if it's a property with a five-year dormancy period, it's, it's property with a date of last contact back in 2015. So you can see how this starts to get pretty complicated as far as timing of the reporting goes or uh, how we can really start to expand farther and farther back into your books and records and why those record retention requirements that we talked about earlier are really difficult. As far as reporting goes, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty here. I just want you to know it's totally different than sales and use tax. It's totally different from income tax. Um, most states require you to do it online. Uh, Delaware, for example, has a secure portal that you go through. And there is this wacky NALPA report format that it has to be in, otherwise most states reject it. And there is software online that you can use. Um, but uh, just keep in mind that th the process is really distinct from, from other you know, tax, actual tax reporting. Um, the derivative rights doctrine. Uh, this is something that we use as a defense often throughout the audit process. Um, the idea of the derivative rights doctrine is that the state's rights are equal to those of the owner. So, um, you know, what we talked about from the beginning is the goal of this is to make sure that the, the owners of the property get their money back. So we're going to give the states equal rights to, to sort of serve as uh, an intermediary or protector of that money until it gets into the rightful hands of the owners. Um, the problem we see often throughout audit is that states tend to take the position that they have more rights than the owner. And that's, and that should, that's really just wrong. That's the, the incorrect interpretation 
Um, using an example, so gift cards, right? So you, you have a gift card, uh, it's worth about a hundred bucks. And uh, if a state requires, let's assume it's a Target gift card. If a state requires Target to escheat that $100 gift card in cash and return it to the owner, well, now you're giving the state or the owner more rights than what they really engaged in, what they, what they contractually engaged in as part of that process. Um, we see that um, more commonly in the context of ex, you know, expiration dates that are set to something um, or like a service where you've, uh, you've agreed to uh, have like a training session for a gym, five training sessions for a hundred bucks. And if you don't use those training sessions within a few months, they expire. Well, states will often try to uh, require that to be cheated, even though the, the parties engaged or they agreed that it was limited to that certain period of time. And that's arguably a violation of the derivative rights doctrine. So Sam, we have a question. I think that'd be a good answer from all the group is, um, do you file zero returns in the states? You know, if you don't have any unclaimed property, should you file zero, uh, zero reports? And, and, you know, I'll give my opinion. I, effectively, it doesn't really matter if there's no statute of limitations, filing the report doesn't move the ball anywhere. So it doesn't really eliminate it. If the state does have any kind of statute of limitations, just like in the income tax side, having a zero report is beneficial. But unless the state has a statute of limitations, just raising your hand and putting down zero doesn't really move anything. I don't know if you guys have different opinions. Right. Yeah. Um, go, go ahead. ahead. As okay. there, some states do require a negative report. Um, and also, if you're filing a negative report just because you haven't had an opportunity to fully review your books and records, that does not help you. So if you're going to file a negative report or zero dollar, that, that really has to be your unclaimed property liability for that state. Yep. And, you know, to that point, and as Sam talked about and, and Laura and Scott talked about, you know, this is not like on the income tax side, sales side, where your customer's located. You think, well, I have no customers there. I have no sales there. That's not relevant. Do you have a vendor there? Do you have anything, any contact there where they could potentially have it? And because they're, the Nexus rules are so different, they don't exist. It's anybody who owes you money or anybody you owe money to. And it, it may not come up through your normal course of review. Yep. So that, that was your boot camp and unclaimed property. And I, you know, I think it, hopefully I put it in context to you why some states matter more than others, how this becomes complicated with each state's set of rules being different. And now I think we want to talk more about recent trends. Um, you know, what's going on with Delaware's VA program, uh, the audit process, and potentially some ways to, to remediate um, a liability. And I, I'm just going to jump in real quick, and this will be really quick, and it's not a message you guys haven't heard before. The pandemic has affected people, okay? Mm -hmm. States need money, and this is a great way for states to get money, to up to increase their audit activity. And what we've seen, you know, we do, Sam has done a real good job of mentioning holding periods, one year, three years, five years. What we see on the state side is shortening up that period of time that it sits dormant before you have to remit it. Why? Because they get the money quicker. If you have to hold it for five years between the last contact when you're admitted, it, it takes them six years to get the money. If you cut that down to one year, it takes them a year to get the money. States need the money, they've been doing that. The other issue that I see on the pandemic side, on the, on the COVID side, which will increase the amount of unclaimed property is the ability for me to be in Alabama and for Laura to be in Cincinnati and for Scott and Sam to be in Chicago. Remoteness, people aren't where they were. Okay, and people are moving all over the place. And so when you're trying to get money to them, when you're trying to get them information, trying to determine where they are, it's become a lot more difficult to pinpoint a state of last known address or to get in contact with people. Remote employees, if you issue them a payroll, a payroll check and they don't have it, what, what is the right state now? Where they were, where you sent it, what your records say, Scott and Laura will get into that, but another impact of the COVID uh, is going to be, or of COVID, not the COVID, of COVID is the fact that people aren't where they used to be and it makes tracing a lot tougher. Um, and you also see just based upon the need for money, which all the states seem to do, increased enforcement gives us opportunity. They waive the VDA, come to us voluntarily, anonymously, whatever it is, will limit what you can do and they're going to get into it. Scott and Laura are going to get a really good job of explaining why 
taking control of the process is huge. Don't let them bite you first. You put forth what you want to get eaten. Okay, and they are going to eat something, but you can control the process a lot more. And even for a period of time, Delaware allows you to voluntarily get into the program. They'll get into all those things of what's going on. But again, just like in most things in life, uh, you could sit back and watch and wait for it to happen to you. You could pray that it doesn't happen to you. That's a viable defense. I, I don't encourage the ostrich approach because we're just seeing it. We're just seeing it filter down to everybody. And there are things you can do now to limit exposure, limit liability, and grab hold of the process so you can get to a predetermined outcome before the state does. So that leads us into our second polling question, which I'm going to try to do quickly here in the, in the sake of time. Oh, no. This, this is the technical glitch we all were warned about. <laughs> Polling questions on Zoom are not user friendly. There we go. There you go. That's the right question. So, which of the following best describes your company situation? We are enrolled in Delaware's unclaimed property voluntary disclosure program currently. We are under uh, unclaimed property audit by Delaware. We completed Delaware's unclaimed property VDA or audit program. It means you're done. Thank you. Relax. Congratulations. We have not yet been contacted by Delaware. Important word I'm putting in there. And I know I got a couple of notes from people that have gone through the process. And you know, those guys, if we were in a live format, I'd ask you guys to tell your stories of horror that you've gone through in this unclaimed property <laughs> audit process. So here are the results. Uh, the overwhelming majority have not yet been contacted by Delaware. Right, and, you know, it's so many, so many businesses, so little time, they're working their way through the list. And, you know, it's not here to scare you about it, just the reality of what we've seen uh, of them rolling down to uh, outside the Fortune 100, outside the Fortune 500 to other businesses. All right, Scott and Laura, do you want to take us into this process? Sure. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off. So I'm Scott Regan from Altus Group. Um, actually, Jordan, I'm, I'm actually in Philly, not Chicago. And uh, I'll tell you, we've got as, about as much snow on the ground as we do, as you guys probably normally do in Chicago. Um, the, the only reason I bring that up is that Delaware is about uh, 30 miles southeast of me over my corner, over my shoulder here. And so what I can tell you about uh, their collection efforts is the roads are bumpy in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania, but as soon as you get in Delaware, they're silky smooth. That's all that unclaimed property. Um, so um, obviously Delaware and Wilmington specifically got a lot of attention this fall with the rise of a new administration, right? I mean, after all, uh, Delaware is the 46th state by population. I think they're the 49th state by land uh, size, but like their own official nickname, the first state, they're the first state of unclaimed property and it's not even close, it's not even close. Two thirds of companies are incorporated in Delaware. Uh, Delaware's own incorporation website lists over 1 million uh, LLCs that are incorporated in Delaware. So really every company has an exposure to the state of Delaware. Uh, Delaware has taken the position that Texas versus New Jersey, the priority rules that Sam talked about, um, and that second priority rule mentioning uh, unknown address gives them an opportunity and a right during an audit or a VDA to extrapolate and estimate a liability for years during the look back period, which is 15 years, 10 years plus the five years of dormancy, for which a company doesn't have researchable records. And based on a statistical sampling of years that you do have records, that would include property due to all other states, they would have the ability to act as the catch all and claim all that property. So that's really important. What, what Delaware's entire regime is built on is because, you know, very, as I pointed out, very few people, very few companies, very few size in Delaware in terms of the size of the state, there's not gonna be a lot of unknown, a lot of address property in Delaware. It's to try to extrapolate and extract unknown address property that would theoretically be tied to other states if the records sufficed. And uh, what we know about under, unknown address property is it's impossible to reclaim. How can I go look for property if I don't know the name or the address behind it? And so Delaware has been, uh, been working on this for over two decades. Uh, they are currently involved in a program. They are looking at every company incorporated in Delaware. So they know every company is incorporated in Delaware, right? And they're just working on a list. 
there's other triggers, of course, no reporting history. Uh, if you have never filed the VDA or an audit in that state, uh, if you've got a, uh, a negative return that you filed uh, prospectively without completing a VDA in that state, that ties to the point we we're making earlier. If you acquired a company, if you stopped filing, uh, and it's not just, as we'll talk about, uh, it's not just your main entity. Almost every company, regardless of whether their main operating entities are incorporated in Delaware, is going to have some LLCs, even if they're small ones, that use Delaware as a state of incorporation. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so as I said, these programs have been around for at least two, at least two decades. Um, the, the VDA and the audit program used to be together uh, in the Department of Finance. There was a lawsuit that Sam and Jordan talked about a bit, Temple Inlet, I think we brought up uh, in 2016, which um, was settled, but did shine some really negative light on the Delaware program, specifically around this sort of estimation technique. And so in 2017, Delaware rewrote their laws uh, to recreate their program to try to address some of the issues that that lawsuit had raised but also notably enshrining permanently in their law uh, for the first time that this estimation technique that they employ um, was the law. Uh, they created a bifurcated process. The um, Secretary of State's office, which is in the business of uh, being friendly to companies in Delaware, handles the VDA program, and the Department of Finance, which is in the business of collecting revenue from companies, handles the audit program. Both companies use vendors. The Secretary of State in the VDA program has two vendors. The Department of Finance for the audit program has four or five vendors. Uh, the new law also directed that the Secretary of State would routinely mail what are known as invitations to companies that they believe could have an obligation to file and claim property in Delaware. And uh, that, uh, that companies who have not gotten one of these invitations may not be audited. So again, in Delaware at the moment, you cannot be audited until you've received one of these invitations and failed to enroll. However, if you receive an invitation, you must enroll within 60 days. If you do not enroll in the Delaware Voluntary Disclosure Agreement Program within 60 days, you will be referred over to the Department of Finance for audit. So they, um, if you can go to the next slide, They began their uh, program back in earnest in 2018 uh, and uh, in October. In 2019, the, the Department of State mailed out approximately 600 of these letters. Uh, and every company that you know, received one, if they enrolled in the program, they're in the VDA program. If they did not accept, if they did not enroll, they were automatically enrolled in the audit program. Uh, last year, due to COVID, they sent out something like 400 letters, maybe 350, uh, but they just announced um, that they are back on track, that they're going to renew their program in full, and uh, it is expected that something in the, in the neighborhood of, you know, three batches of 200 or about 600 notices will go out, and the dates have been announced as February 19th, May 14th, and August 20th. Um, the underpinnings of uh, both programs are essentially the same. They're attempting to leverage that second priority rule to an extrapolate uh, a liability. And of course, they're looking to, to collect uh, actual unclaimed property with addresses in Delaware. Um, I think the, the big difference between the two programs really is that the VDA program is designed to be corporate friendly. Um, they, um, companies who are enrolled in that program and their advocacy teams, which is usually you know, a, a accounting firm uh, like Altus and a law firm like HMB are able to uh, select the strata um, and determine the eligibility of the uh, entities that are going to be put into this uh, program and to um, choose their own pace. Uh, generally speaking, there's an expectation that the program will last between 18 and 24 months, whereas the auto program, as we can see, goes on for years. Um, the uh, obtained interest is waived in the VDA program. Uh, so I think in reality, it, it's a very good program. 
the you know really the the probably the, in my mind the things that are most agreeable are the ability to select the strata and I'm, I'm going to let Laura dive into the technical aspects of this in a moment but to to only not only select the companies in scope on your entity list but also to select the estimation strata using the most favorable techniques as opposed to the least favorable techniques which the auditors will will choose um, yeah please jump in there's a quick question you mentioned the LLCs. The question is if you have a parent company incorporated in Delaware, but the LLCs that are, are organized in another state, can Delaware attack those? I think the answer would be, and Laura might have an opinion too. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, one, one of the things you jump into is really, you know, who has the liability, right? Is there a shared service center that's paying uh, and has obligations for all the entities of the company, or um, are those separate? So, in terms of the, you know, a traditional VDA or an audit, you know, you're going to have your Delaware entities, your non-Delaware entities. If the non-Delaware entities don't really have their own accounting, uh, then um, they're they're not really going to be in scope. But if you have um, those, you know, if you have a decentralized disbursements and credits then those, those entities could be in scope for non-Delaware address property. Laura, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. And I, I also think there's, there's a legal argument to be made because it's the second priority rule is state of an organization or incorporation. And LLCs, while we think about them from the tax aspect, if they're single member, they're flow through. But from the business world, they are separate and distinct entities. And I argue you know, that each entity then has to look at itself to determine what its state of organization, state of incorporation is. And I, I think it's a pretty good argument to say, even though for tax purposes, it, it flows through, or even for books and record purposes, if they can segment out what's associated with a particular LLC as opposed to the business, they were able to do that, that might go with the LLC and its state of organization versus the parent company. That makes sense for sure. Um, all right, so slide 18. So um, two programs, VDA program more favorable, sort of choose your own adventure, the audit program uh, less so. Um, in terms of the details, I'll, I'm gonna defer in a moment to Laura, but, but generally speaking, um, you know, you, you're getting one of these letters, uh, hopefully you're accepting because you don't wanna be in the audit. Um, one of the problems is, you know, we're all remote. These letters go to the mailroom, nobody sees them. 60 days later, boom, you're in the audit program. But assuming you did, enroll, um, you'll be assigned to a, um, a vendor. They have two vendors. Um, and then you'll receive your, uh, your, your sort of self, it's really a self audit, your checklist. And you'll begin to select the entities to scope. You'll begin to look for unclaimed property with Delaware addresses. You'll um, begin to dive into your chart of accounts. Um, you'll begin to create potential estimation populations if required. And then ultimately you'll, you'll present your findings to their vendor who will push back and poke holes, but, but really will, you know, if you make a good strong argument, we'll accept what you're providing. And then you'll go to the state and get, a, get that signed off, get a release and make payment. That's sort of the process for the, for the VDA. You can go to the next one. And again, Laura's gonna come in with some more details. So the, 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 the audit program, um, this program is, it, it, this really can't be said strongly enough, is, is much, much more disadvantageous. Uh, these contingent fee auditors are paid on a, on a contingent basis. You know, as Jordan pointed out earlier and Sam, you know, sometimes they make the argument they're really paid on an hourly basis, but, uh, you know, it's pretty well known they're just trilling up those hours against, you know, potential uh, estimations. Um, the audit firms, the unclaimed property contingent audit firms are there to create a liability. Uh, those auditors control the scope as opposed to the VDA. They control the document requests. Uh, they choose all the strata for the estimations and they're gonna choose the wildest strata that they could possibly get away with. Um, these audits can take, you know, on average three to five years. Uh, we've seen audits go eight years or 10 years or longer. Um, we're just sometimes you- This morning with uh, someone who said they were on an, they had an audit going, what was it, 14 years, Jordan? 11 years. 11, 11. okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I like to think of these auditors like Lucille Ball at the Chocolate Factory with the compare book going around. She's stuffing her face here, but she's trying to fix these ones and trying to fix those ones. 
you know, these firms are understaffed. They've got more, you know, more audits that they can handle and uh, they're not in any rush. Um, and, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, and some of these lawsuits, Eaton, Fruit Loom and Siemens, you know, the, these firms thought they were negotiating good faith. They were in an expedited audit program and, you know, Delaware booted them out and, and subsequently they, they sued Delaware um, over, you know, sort of disagreements they had with, uh, with the auditors. And um, in fact, this, this area is and more than ever, uh, really for years, we've all been waiting for lawsuits. I mean, really decades. Um, and there's, there's at least five right now in U.S. District Court uh, over unclaimed property audits from Delaware using Kelmar, one of their other third-party audit firms, and this approach over estimation. And so, um, you know, if, if companies have an appetite for, you know, multi-year litigation, the audit program might be the place for them. But, you know, but for that, uh, we really think the VDA program is the, is the best uh, solution. Um, and so um, I think I'm going to kick it off now to Laura to get into some of the details. And just one quick and, question, and I'm going to answer this really quickly. We had a question about do states, other states have VDA programs similar to Delaware? A number of states have VDA programs. Yeah. Delaware is a, a little bit unique, but... Um, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting. Like if, if uh, there, there are, um, uh, I think all states either have a formal or an informal VDA program. You can, you can negotiate a settlement with every state but California. Um, California won't, won't do one, but there are actually, um, there are new VDA programs in Indiana, Pennsylvania, Utah, and Washington State, which were kicked off this year, and uh, Utah, uh, and those states, by the way, have hired other vendors, which is, you know, again, Delaware was the only one that used a vendor. There's, we'll talk a little bit about the two main firms out there, but uh, Kelmar and Varus, um, but these other states have hired Varus to run their VDA programs. And they did just send letters in January, Utah specifically to companies that they believe, you know, are incorporated in that state. And so it's likely that they're gonna to try to employ, you know, some of those estimation techniques as well. All right, Laura, take us through it. Excellent. All right, well, thank you guys so much. Um, so you really wanna st start with scoping, which is kind of getting your house in order to perform the VDA. So a VDA review, like Scott had indicated, can take about 18 to 24 months, but you are in control of the pace and the scope of this review. Um, you know, 18 to 24 months might seem lengthy, but as Scott had mentioned, you know, and Jordan had entered the client he had just talked to has been in an audit for 11 years. So, you know, being able to go through the VDA program really allowed you to more expedited through your review. Um, you wanna start with looking at your current and historical organization charts to determine what entities you want to include in the VDA. Um, some information you wanna include when you're looking at those entities is like the FAIN numbers, where they're incorporated, um, sort of answering that question um, that came in earlier, um, all your LLCs and your entities, where are they incorporated when were they incorporated? Did they ever reincorporate at any point and when that occurred? And also um, m and activity or divestitures, which I know Jordan's gonna get into more details, but you want to have a very firm understanding if something has been um, you know, acquired and whether that is an entity, an equity purchase or a um, asset purchase because your unclaimed property liability is different between the two. Um, with a VDA, you want to try to include as many entities as possible to get a release at the end of the day, even companies that are not incorporated in Delaware, um, even holding companies, because you can show that there is no activity, no revenue, no operations, but still be able to get a release at the end of the day for the VDA. Whereas the very opposite is true with an audit. We do our best to try to limit the scope of the audit to limit the overreach um, to reduce your liability. You know, once you've identified all of your entities in scope, you know, you want to see if any of those entities already have existing policies and procedures, um, like Scott had talked about before, how is the financial functions uh, you know, being handled? Is there shared services? Is it siloed? Are you going to have to go to each entity's individual accounting group? Um, or is there shared services? Like Sam had talked about, 
earlier, you know, then you want to identify all of your sources of unclaimed property. Um, that would be a review of the trial balances associated with all of the entities that are in scope. That's going to allow you to identify your cash accounts, your liabilities, your um, accounts receivable, um, accounts which might be credits, unapplied, unidentified remittances and write-offs, you know, whether you've you know, issued gift cards in the past or not. Once you've identified all of your sources of unclaimed property from the trial balance, and especially your cash accounts, you want to kind of put that together in a bank account matrix to determine which accounts disperse checks, you know, when those accounts were open or closed. Um, and also you want to see preliminarily at least what bank reconciliation is, are available, outstanding checklists, your bank statements, you know, for any uh, entity that warrants review. Um, do you have check register information available for those associated cash accounts? Can you produce a systematic void report with void coding and dates? You know, how far back um, do you have complete books and records, which I'm gonna get into much more in detail later in these slides. You also wanna understand whether any third party administrators are being used uh, for payroll, benefits, gift cards, transfer agents. Um, do any of those third parties handle unclaimed property or sheet on your behalf? What contracts are available? What prior unclaimed property history might be available? Um, because with unclaimed property, even if a third party is a sheeting on your behalf, you cannot fully shift that liability. So you have to make sure that your TPA or third party administrators are a sheeting correctly. Next slide, please. All right, so now you've completed your scoping and gotten your financial house in order, it's time to actually start gathering the records to produce research populations and quantify your initial unclaimed property liability. With the VDA, we help our clients minimize your liability as much as possible, whereas the opposite is true with an audit. The auditors are incentivized to make that liability as high as possible and increase your populations. You know, if your company has filed unclaimed property historically, you'll want to gather this information and create an unclaimed property reporting master. Uh, which is going to be helpful in many different regards, as well as any property you've resolved during that due diligence efforts and mailings that Sam had talked about earlier. Um, because any property in which you have reported to other states in the estimation periods, which we'll get into more detail on later, can reduce your liability due to Delaware. So getting a good handle on any property you have reported as unclaimed property to other states is ideal. Um, now you wanna start developing your populations, which for disbursements um, with Delaware, their disbursements have a five-year dormancy. So if you have a holder who signed up in 2020 you have your five-year dormancy, which puts you back to 2015 is the start of the review period. And then you're gonna subtract that 10 years. So you're looking at records from 2005 through 2015 for your VDA review. You know, for disbursements, Delaware's VDA program, which is advantageous, as long as you can validate completeness of that check register and it has disposition information, you can use and leverage that check register to identify any checks that are voided 90 days or greater or any checks that remain outstanding um, either on your check register and or your outstanding checklist. For liabilities, you want to be looking at any aged unused deposits or prepayment or age suspense. For AR, like Jordan had said before, it is shocking how much liability can stem from accounts receivable property. There's aged open credits, unapplied payments, unidentified remittances, but what really gets a lot of holders um, through the VDA or an audit um, is write-offs that might have happened. 
Um, and if you do not know all of your GL accounts in which you may have written off credits historically, you have to then perform a tracer exercise, which might have um, looking at any credits at age over 90 days and falls off a subsequent quarterly aging. And how did that fall off? Did you refund that? Did that um, reduce a subsequent invoice? But if you wrote that off to a GL account, every time you wrote that off and as many accounts you've written it off to, those have to be reviewed in their entirety. Now, Delaware in the VDA program allows you to net debit write-offs and credit write-offs, but any customer in a net credit position is potential unclean property for a VDA and, and certainly for an audit. You know, if um, the entities in question are equity property, you'll have to work with the transfer agent to get um, a listing of any dormant um, or inactive accounts that'll have a Delaware foreign or a new address. Now foreign, um, there's a lot of arguments about foreign property, whether or not that should be considered Delaware. When you go into a VDA, you are somewhat accepting um, Delaware's position that foreign is uh, Delaware sourced, but that is definitely something that we do always reserve our rights um, to fight that and at least acknowledge that we don't completely agree with the foreign position. But you wanna look at those shareholders that are dormant. You wanna look at any uncashed dividend checks for Delaware property. And if you've engaged in any merger and acquisition activity and there's unexchanged shares, similarly, you need to look for Delaware property for that as well. Next slide, please. So for that holder that enrolled in 2020, that you know, you're looking at periods between 2015 back to 2005, you know, can a holder produce both system records all the way back to 2005? And can you produce supporting documentation that will satisfy how that liability was resolved? So for instance, if a check was voided in 2006 and reissued in 2007, can you provide a bank support, whether that is a paid statement or the front and back of a cash check that demonstrates that that check cleared the bank? Often due to system conversions, um, going back to the initial talks about record retention for taxes, often, companies only are keeping records for seven years. And the same is true often for banks. So if you're not maintaining the paid details for the last 15 years, um, and you go to your bank today, you're only going to get the last seven years of paid detail that they have on file. So you have to meet both criteria of complete and researchable if you can, if that is the true for your company, then you can narrow all populations to just Delaware foreign unknown for if you can hit both criteria. Now it's important to know that maybe you can do that for AP, but you can't do that for payroll. That is acceptable. You do not have to have for each entity and each property type the same base years, um, but you know, if you're able to meet both criteria, you can limit the review to just Delaware property. Um, if we go to the next slide, real quick. Okay, if you cannot produce both complete and researchable records for that full 15 years, this is where estimations come in. So let's say in our example of the holder who signed up in 2020 that they had to go to the bank to get paid details. So they are limited to the last seven years. So they're looking at records that are complete between 2015 and 2013. From 2012 back to 2005, that is going to be your estimation period because you do not have complete response searchable records. And going back to um, the earlier discussions about the priority rules, Delaware's defense of that estimation is that, you know, they're stepping in 
on behalf of the unknown holder and that second priority rule, but all of those estimations go straight into their coffers because there is no known at the owner associated with the estimations, which is why they are so keen on the VDA and audit program and having complete and researchable records is so difficult and estimations often become a factor. Next slide, please. Hey, hey Laura, before you go oh. on, I just wanted to, yeah. um, I think, and Jordan, we were just sidebarring. We're probably gonna go a little bit over, we're having so much fun here, a little bit over 2.30. So folks who wanna hang in there, please do, right, Jordan? Yeah, yeah. No, we wanna make sure we get through everything. And that's the, let's talk about advantage of a Zoom webinar with no one behind it. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Sure. Right, yeah. Okay. So um, when you are dealing with an estimation calculation, you know, you have that base period for our example, it's 15 to 13. The estimation years are 12 to 2005. Now what they will do is take the liability or the items you could not research and resolve in 15 to 13. They'll take that over revenue for 13 to 15 to come up with an abandonment percentage or an error rate. And then that error rate is multiplied by the revenue of your estimation period for 2005 to 2012 to get your estimated liability due to Delaware. So it's your actual base period liability due to Delaware. Your estimated liability is what you're actually going to be paying Delaware and then subtracting out any unclaimed property reporting you've done to other states in the estimation period. And just to make sure you understand that base period includes all addresses, not just Delaware addresses in that base period. And if you go to the next slide, this is a case study of what that's going to look like in a statistical sampling. So you have various strata here um, for our population. Uh, we've disregarded anything less than $50. We've disregarded anything above 10,000. So you're just looking at items for $50 and one cents through $2,000. Um, from that base population, there was a sample that was created. They were able to remediate all but 24,000 of that to get your applied to the population liability of about 62.4. So if you can uh, move to the next slide. So you have your base period liability of that 624, which is that, you know, in this case, 2011 to 15, you have your revenue, here's your abandonment percentage. Then you've got that abandonment percentage multiplied by your estimation years to get your estimated liability due to Delaware, less any filings that had been done to other states. So you can see here that there was only about $700 in actual property that was due to Delaware, but the estimation amount is about $700,000. So a small actual liability can equate to a very significant liability for estimations. And Next that's slide, please. The scary part. Oh. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> So all of the activity that you had done in a VDA um, will transfer, like you, you choose one or the other. So all of the populations, but what is most uh, disadvantaged in, in a VDA, excuse me, in an audit is unlike the VDA where you are only looking at voids over 90 days, the auditors are gonna look at voids over 30 days. And with a VDA, at the end of the day, you're only producing your liability due to Delaware. Um, with an audit, the auditors will shop that audit to all of their client states. And um, I know the gentleman on the call had mentioned Kelmar. Kelmar has over 30 client states. So you can get audit notices from over 30 states joining your audit. Now, Estimations would not come into play for those participating states, but actual address property to those participating states you would owe in addition to what you owe to Delaware. You're going to get an information request, which is going to be voluminous. Um, and 
frequent and the duration of an audit is three or more years because you are at their mercy and their pace. And like um, Scott had said, they have so many audits. They're sending you requests and then you're going to get more and more requests and it's very lengthy. And they're going to produce their populations for research. But unlike a VDA, where we're trying to minimize, we're trying to give you the best opportunity to present arguments to the Delaware administrator of your specific business practice to reduce your liability, the opposite is true. They are going to try to maximize your populations, maximize the liability, be difficult when it comes to trying to explain your individual business practice and why something is you don't consider it to be unclaimed property. Um, so an audit is disadvantage, uh, disin, excuse me, not advantageous for many regards. If you can move to the next slide. Um, and like uh, Jordan had said before, they are going to choose the sampling technique that is going to result in the highest liability possible. And remediation, um, there is standards of remediation for both the VDA and the audit, but the audit remediation standard is often far more rigorous and difficult, and they will be less inclined to um, clear an item. Um, as you have gone through a population and provided remediation, and you're close to the end of your remediation efforts, you're going to get your interim status report. And that's the first time that you're going to see your potential estimated interest due to Delaware. And that's usually when our clients throw a lot more uh, resources to the audit to try and reduce the items that remain and produce a lot more remediation. When you are completed your remediation efforts, you're gonna get your report of examination. And then thereafter, your statement of findings and requests for payment. Now, you do have uh, some avenues here. If you disagree with your audit findings, there is an appeals process. And usually with an audit, it is highly recommended um, for the VDA as well, but more so than ever with a audit that you retain both legal counsel and an accounting advocate because you've established confidentiality and privilege from the beginning because often litigation is um, sometimes your option for fighting against the request for payment if you disagree with what the auditors have continued, considered your liability. Now, best practices for an audit. So we would highly recommend that you get a release agreement and that should include all entities that were in the audit, all property types, holder names, years. Um, let's say an audit state doesn't wanna give you a release agreement. You should still have a draft release agreement and retain that for your records um, in the event of a future audit. You know. Um, in an audit, you and a VDA, you know, your main liability is being satisfied with Delaware and in an audit, any other participating states, but you could surely have extreme or, or a lot of liability to states that didn't participate. You definitely want to make sure that you are resolving those gaps and getting that property um, reported to those other states. And then devising policies and procedures so that you are in capturing all of the entities, all the property types that you've included in the review. And once you are fully compliant, now is your opportunity to try to get some funds back from the state. So other holders have remitted property that is due to you. And that is when you should try to recover those funds. Moreover, let's say through the um, review in the VDA, you determined that you may have made overpayments, maybe you didn't take certain exemptions, maybe there were, um, you were reporting charitable contributions or you're reporting amounts due to the federal government. Those are all properties that you can try to get back from the state um, and reduce reporting those items going forward. 
Next slide. All right, Sam and Jordan, I think uh, we we're going to hand this one off to you guys to start, right? Yeah, Jordan, do you want to tackle this? Yeah, sure, I, just, I think Laura did a, a good job earlier of, of talking about how throughout the audit process, it can be important to use, um, you know, both the accountant side and the legal side. So those are the two sides that you've had here today throughout this webinar. Uh, go ahead, Jordan. Our goal, obviously, and I think the concern of our clients is not to have duplication of effort, and we've worked with a number of consulting firms, and we really have our own little playgrounds that we play in, and of course, there's coordination between them, but we, you know, I'm a CPA, and I've got my partners are CPAs, we don't get involved in the books and records, the digging, the tracing, that stuff, the accountants do a phenomenal job doing that. Scott and Laura do a great job of doing that. They'll look at that stuff. I can look at it, understand it, but you don't want to pay me at my rates to do it either. When we get down to issues about um, the NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, something you entered right and again, closing agreements at the end of the process, legal questions that we bring up, pushing back on the Stop application me. of state statutes, that's where HMB gets involved. And we step back, we get involved a lot in the beginning, we observe a lot in the middle, get in when we have to, and then we have some activity at the end. But really, it really dovetails very well between uh, consulting firms like Altus and, and HMB, and, and it just works out well. And our goal then, and the concern we run into, we work really hard to avoid duplication. And we get that through experience and what we're best at. And, you know, it's admitting fallibility or just other people are just better at stuff than, than we are. And, and I think it works both ways. So let's, uh, let's do our third polling question here, which is how does your company manage unclaimed property compliance and filings currently? Do you use third-party software? Do you outsource to a service provider? Uh, is there a manual process or free software that you use? Or you're not yet filing, you're considering compliance options for the first time right now. <laughs> So I'm going to end the polling. So uh, the majority of people are not yet filing. They are considering compliance. So I, hopefully this is going to be really important in making those decisions as how, how to move forward. Great. So Jordan, do you want to take us into some of the considerations in the M&A process? Sure, absolutely. And, and this is going to be relatively quick and because it's come up just like all liabilities, equity stock versus assets. Um, there really isn't much in the way of, of successor liability with asset purchases um, unless you're buying the liabilities themselves. And I, I've seen deals where negotiated, they carve out unclaimed property liabilities and it's retained by the seller or it transfers to the owner, but it's specifically addressed. Basically, if you buy the liabilities, You've got the unclaimed property issues with everything that hasn't been cashed. If you buy the receivables as part of the business, you're buying the credits as well, and therefore you bought that asset. Other than that, if you're buying a piece of machinery and it's unencumbered, you don't buy anything, right? There's no unclaimed property associated with that versus the typical equity stock purchase where everything goes with it and you inherit all the liabilities. So that's really easy. But I, I wanna focus in on a little bit of what we've seen just in general practice here. Um, we've worked really, really hard to get our business people up to stuff about state and local taxes, uh, what they should look for, kind of due diligence, nexus, apportionment, sales tax, wayfair, blah, 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 all that stuff. And recently our push has been unclaimed property because we've run into a couple of situations where it is an undisclosed liability after the holdbacks are over and all of a sudden they get contacted by a state and they try to claw it back from the, from the seller. And the seller says, I'm out of here, right? I don't have anything to do with it. So we've tried to make it, and they're, they're multi-million dollar potential liabilities that they jump into that they don't think about. So it's generally not looked at, and it's an easy thing to do, just like all due diligence. Um, show me your unclaimed property reports. And if they do file them, it's not the fact that they file one in every state, what's being reported on those? That's what you have to look at. Is it just, it's not just checks and it's not just payroll, it's not just payable. It is that we've talked about the receivable side, the credits, other things, and the Third party auditors are always creating new classes of unclaimed property. It's a never ending re resource that they try to do. So we have to know that and understand 
in all deals, there's reps and warranties. And, and just like any other tax one, it's like, oh, I represent, I paid it all. Um, and if I don't, I'll warranty you. I hate those. I understand them. All you have is a contract right against the person who sold you the bag of goods. The states could care less. They're going to come after whoever has the assets and liabilities now. So reps and warranties, while good in the business context, in our world are very dangerous because you, the state comes to you and you go, whoa, whoa, I've got a contract that says they're responsible. And they go, sue me, don't care. And the state doesn't care. This is not you know, separate, and, uh, separate liability, um, divisible liability. You have the business, it's your obligation. States don't have to worry about any of the successors at all or the previous owners at all. And what we're seeing now is states have wanted to get more money, passing laws that are saying, oh yeah, by the way, we always had a record retention for 15 years. Well, that's a bunch of crap, for Latin for crapus. Um, it's not true. And they try to say, well, now it applies backwards. So even though you didn't know you had to have records for 15 years, we passed a law in 2018 or 2019 that says you were supposed to have them. And you're going, we've destroyed them. Business policy dictates after seven years, we get rid of them. We can't go back and recreate. So there are trying to pass these laws to try to justify their audit process. We push back really hard on those things. And that is one of the areas of contention for the lawsuits that are going on, primarily against Delaware, but other states as well. Uh, lack of historical records. Again, we've talked about that. Um, I, I know there are some specific questions with respect to M&A. If you find M&A, if you find unclaimed property issues during the due diligence process, it is a real number almost always. And it's something to address with. We were just retained in a project, just, it was a gift card. They had a business, stores, retail stores, but they had a gift card program. We were brought in for the whole deal to make sure that we could protect and understand the gift card um, ramifications, where to reincorporate it through that. I mean, because potentially they're looking at a $15 million hit of the $60 million acquisition associated just with unclaimed property for the gift cards. So we were brought in, these are real numbers, real dollars. It doesn't exist in every deal, but it, it, it to that magnitude, but it, I will tell you, it exists in every single deal that's out there and you just gotta be worried about it. And then it's you know not just a liability, if you're found, it's penalties and interest what the states are now trying to impose. Delaware's old prostitute, just to tell you this, they got pushed back on it, was 50% penalty, 50% interest of the liability. Okay, so you've doubled anything that you potentially owe somebody. Now they got pushed back for due process purposes and they've wished laxed it. And oftentimes if you're cooperative, they'll not do it, but states are needing the money. We're seeing the imposition of penalties and interest dramatically more enforced than it was before uh, the pandemic and the need for money. Audit risk, we've talked about it. They've done a great job of talking about how states are sending out hundreds of letters every single couple months, trying to contact people. And this is an obligation that exists. They're just reminding you of it. So it is a chance to go back, ask about it. Ask your credit people, ask your payable people. What do we do if things don't get cashed? What do we do with credits? Do we take them back in income? Start the inquiry and then don't panic. There are ways to address this. So I know I'm talking really fast again, but I know we've kept you late and I really appreciate everybody sticking around. Uh, we're gonna get to the end here. Uh, a couple of things to look, be careful of on a go forward basis. So that leads us into our final polling question. which is why is it important to review the complete books and records for an acquisition target? Unclaimed property audits or volunteer disclosures look back 10 to 15 years to gain a complete understanding of historical exposure for a purchase price allocation, both one and two, none of the above. And I bet you guys can guess which one it's gonna be. So the, the most common answer being both one and two um, in order to Make sure you've got the look back covered to have a complete historical understanding of, of exposure. Okay, so that leads us into our, our final section here, um, future considerations. And we have a few on the slide uh, that we can talk about. I, I think uh, maybe a good way to do this guys would be, um, I'll, I'll talk about one future consideration I see, which is uh, the California PD program. If you guys wanna, you know, talk about where you think things are going, maybe a takeaway, and we can uh, we can wrap it up from there. So uh, we've talked about in, you know, in, in quite extensively the Delaware VDA program. Someone asked earlier whether there are other states with VDA programs. California is a state where people had complained for years that there was no VDA program, no amnesty program. 
So in March of 2019, the California Legislative Analyst Office issued a report recommending that there be uh, an amnesty program. And there was even a budget bill passed in September of 2019 that directed the governor um, or that the governor signed to direct the controller to come up with a plan to, to have a voluntary disclosure or some sort of compliance program. And they ultimately determined that amnesty wasn't supported. They didn't think it was a good idea, which is just crazy to me when you look at a state like California, where statistics say that of all of the California businesses, only 2% are currently filing unclaimed property reports. So California is leaving a lot of money on the table and they're not providing an opportunity for taxpayers to come forward and try to remedy this in either an efficient way or um, you know, in, in a way that they feel is most comfortable for their business. Uh, Scott, I know you had mentioned earlier uh, some self audit letters that had gone out in a few states. Do you want to talk about that or, or any other big takeaways that you guys see for future considerations? Sure, Laura, anything you want to add first? No, go right ahead, Scott. Um, yeah, so I mean, my view is that the states are going to try to get more money earlier, give less of it away, and keep more of it permanently. And so we've seen um, definitely there's some just some additional VDA programs. You know, this is probably a bit tied directly to to Jordan's point about budget shortfalls from COVID. The states, you know, their their revenues cratered, and so there's you know four states: Indiana, Pennsylvania, Utah, Wisconsin, all gone out and hired vendors just like Delaware has to start programs and start notifying. There's been a lot of uh, legislation. Uh, that's had the net effect of reducing things like business to business exemptions in Illinois, which was a longstanding exemption that was repealed two years ago or, uh, and, and made retroactive. There are um, states that are looking to, um, to require companies to notify less, meaning they, they're saying you don't have to, or we're instructing you almost not to send a letter um, for property below a certain amount, figuring you know, if less companies get notified, more unclaimed property gets turned over to the states. And some states are starting to pass laws um, that uh, allow the states to permanently keep smaller amounts, let's say under $50, under $10, the net effect being, you know, you put a lot of, a lot of pennies on the floor. If you're willing to pick up all those pennies, you're going to get a good amount that you can keep. So I think the states are looking to take more of this and take it permanently. And, and I would just wrap with I think the next frontier, you mentioned digital currency, we'll see where that goes, but the states are really trying to crack ERISA protected property, uh, you know, in retirement. And so uh, ERISA, you know, appears to protect a lot of uh, assets from all of us who are trying to retire someday. States would love to get their hands on a bunch of that. And there's been some, some activity lately in that regard. That's good. Uh, I, would, I would just add one other thing. It, and for legislatively, and we why we see this fear, um, this is not a tax. And the extent that they mm -hmm. expand unclaimed property laws, they grab more types of, of classes of assets, the extent that they drop the de minimis exception and they say, just don't report, just pay us 50 bucks, don't tell us who it is, and they get to keep more and more of the money. This does not have to go through any legislative process that a lot of states like California said, if it's a tax increase, you've got to get a super majority or a majority of the voters to do it, and you can't do it without, right? All those restrictions on passing new and greater taxes don't apply to unclaimed property. This is just free money for the state. So the smart states are saying, we don't have to go through the, we didn't raise taxes, we didn't do this, it's on businesses. This is a panacea for them. This is a great way to raise additional funds. And that's why we see this scope that's been going like this start to go like this, of states trying to enforce it. I totally agree. And then just finally, I mean, to Sam's point on California too, you know, the, what they're hoping for is that they're, they're they have an automatic 18% per annum compounded penalty and interest for anything that's filed late. And they assume that that is enough of a, of a stick. The problem is nobody, nobody reports anything in California, right? And so if California was smart, they'd, they develop a program. So for folks who are, who are you know, participating today, if you do have liability in California, fortunately, that's the state where you have to say, you, you really can't file it. Uh, at this point, you have to tuck it away and, and make every effort to try to remediate. That's probably my best practice in California. Yep. Well, 
I, I was just going to say, uh, in, uh, Laura, if you have something, I, I was going to kind of close this down here. Go ahead. Well over our, our, our limit. Um, we appreciate it. We took adva full advantage of a Zoom webinar as opposed to an in-person conference. Um, we truly, truly appreciate you guys sticking around, particularly those who've stuck around to the end. Um, uh, we've tried to address most of your questions throughout the presentation. Reach out to any one of us with questions throughout the time. We'll be sending you a copy of the PowerPoint to everybody uh, who requested or maybe everybody who signed up or participated. Um, we really appreciate your time. And if there's anything we can do for you, there is no silly question. There is no little question. We're here to help you guys. And um, again, just thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing everybody in person. Someday. Someday. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.